All right. Welcome back, everyone, to another Welcome to the J podcast. I'm your host, Johannes Manigo. We have a very special guest with us today. Before we get into it, though, make sure to like and subscribe, share the field of 68 Media Network. Thank you guys again for all of the support that we've received these last couple of weeks, especially. Uh, let's get into it, shall we? We have our 13th guest in season number three of the Welcome to the J podcast. This man quite literally needs no introduction. And I've been saying that about our guests for the last couple of weeks. It's literally true. You guys know these guys. They've been fan favorites. They've stood up for the Jays for years. This is Isaiah Zigmas Ziggy. <laughs> Zierden in the building. What up, Isaiah? How you doing, so bro? I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Man, it's been so good. It's just so good to see you. Like uh, you've been kind of like out, yeah. out and about. We haven't heard from you much. I know Jay's fans have been kind of wondering what you've been up to. We'll get into all of that for sure. But first of all, uh, I know you're in KC right now. I know that you came over to like see your sister and and you brought your mom with you. So I appreciate a little bit of time that you're giving us today for sure. But of course, the Jays fans want to know how you've been doing, how you how you've been living, what you, what have you been up to? Oh man, I, well, at first, you know, I appreciate you having me on. It's always fun getting to see you. It's been a minute. Um, I've been I've been kind of laying low. Um, obviously, I've always been that kind of kind of guy, but uh, just kind of <laughs> taking care, trying to take care of myself first. Uh, I've been going through some stuff, but on the uh, on the up and up, and you know, just trying to get back so it's been good been good we love to hear it and you know like i always say bro you're my guy you're my brother from day one we're gonna have a whole lot of fun today guys like <laughs> the jays are winning i'm seeing my boy ziggy like this is this is gonna be a really good episode i'm sure there's gonna be a plenty of laughter like there always is when i say it's on on the welcome to the j podcast it's gonna be his third time obviously he, he's a reoccurring character we wouldn't have it any other way Let's get right into business for sure. The Jays win 104 to 76 against St. John's uh, in the game at home, where they basically control the action from tip to the final buzzer. Uh, starting five playing extremely well. Everybody scoring in double figured. Highlighted by Baylor Sharman scoring 17. Ryan Carpenter scoring 16. Ryan Nehart scoring 16 as well. Both of those guys were on a post game interview. But what I was really impressed with the Jays was obviously the ball movement. Um, and, and the shot selections that they had. When we had Ross Bruni on the podcast, he talked about the quality of shots that the Jays had, but it just wasn't falling. Isaiah, you, I know you saw the, the, the ball movement that the Jays had also. What was your take on the game, uh, you know, after the buzzer sounded? And what are some positives that you saw from the Jays watching this game? Well, you know, it, obviously – Prior, you know, the beginning season, the, you know, mid season now, a lot of ups and downs, but that happens, you know, sometimes shots don't fall. Um, but what I was more, you know, impressed with is the fact that obviously being a player, you know, it doesn't, it shouldn't phase you. You stick with it, you know what works and it's going to, it's going to fall eventually. So uh, for me, it was just nice to see that the, once you get the, the confidence in the, move it you know you move the ball you get the confidence going shots fall that's when you know you you can see what the potential is because when shots don't fall you know it looks bad everyone's like oh god we need to do something different and you know fans are like oh you know we're not winning games so we need to change it up but um you know game like the one against st john's um really shows you what what can happen if you have, you know, a game like that in the, in the NCAA tournament. And it's such balance going too. I mentioned the starting five, everybody being in double figures, uh, nobody's scoring over 20 points, but obviously the Jays put up 104 points. Mac was finally able to pull out the starting five relatively early into the game. And, you know, we got a glimpse of maybe some of Crane's future with some of the guys that were able to come in and contribute. You know, Fred King had a pretty good hand in there scoring seven points off the bench. Uh, most of them being, you know, in that late stage of the game. But, you know, we've been lamenting so much about the lack of bench scoring that we always give props to the bench whenever they come in and they produce. So, mm -hmm. again, down the stretch, the game is kind of out of hand. You see what the Jays' future could kind of look like. Talk to me about, like, a guy like Fred King, a guy, um, you know, we, we saw some uh, positive things from Sharif Mitchell throughout the game. Um, talk to me about like how important it is, you know, to come off the bench and, and to produce 
you and I have both been in those situations. Where, what right. is kind of like your mindset when you're on the bench ready to step into a game? Well, you know, when you when you finally get that that opportunity, even in a blow, you know, even if it's a blowout game, you you yeah. get get into the game and you know you get a, a couple buckets or you know you you do anything and you're all of a sudden your confidence just goes through the roof because you know you know that's a team that's in the Big East. You play them all the time. It's not like, you know, you're playing somebody, you know, preseason or anything like that. Like, the, it matters, um, even though the game's already out of hand. It builds a ton of confidence. So, um, but it also is good to, you'll know the this feeling, having to be able to, to come out of the game as, you know, a guy who plays a bunch of minutes and see those guys be able to get into the game and have fun. That's mm -hmm. that's great too. You know, you love to you love to root for your teammates. You know, battle every day in practice that they finally get in and get to get to do something in the game. So I'm sure I'm sure everybody was feeling good at the at the end and feeling great the next day of practice. That's one of those things that I think is very underrated and like the camaraderie that is in a locker room is how much like the starting five, the sixth man, the seventh guy, how much they appreciate watching like the rest of the guys don't get a lot of shine, a lot of burn, right. being able to come in. Like Xander Yates came in and knocked out three threes and the crowd was rocking. Like the, the ones who stayed at the CHI health center, they were rocking. The guys on the bench were jumping around. Like that is one of our favorite things. I remember right. when Stephen Farini made his first bucket <laughs> my senior year, we all absolutely lost our minds. You guys need to go back and like maybe find that clip, but no, yeah. I, I get you. Like, uh, that's also one of the things that both Ryan's, uh, Ryan Nemhart and Ryan Kostbrenner and the post-game presser kind of mentioned was how well the scout team prepared them for this upcoming uh, game against St. John's. Ryan Nemhart even went as far to say that uh, some possessions in the game felt easier than what they had experienced in practice. You were a fifth-year guy. Your freshman year, you redshirted. You were a part of those scout teams where, you know, you had to prepare right. the starting five, the rest of the guys to get ready. How important is it to give, you know, th these are some of the underrated things that we don't think about when we're it's all, it's basketball all the, fans. It's all the stuff that isn't in the light that no one sees. Exactly. So it, doesn't, it doesn't actually draw that much of attention, but yeah, I know. So I, I, was, I just want to ask you, as a guy who was on the scout team and then was being pushed by the scout team later on in your career, how important is it for those guys to really give a good look, obviously, like the way that the Jays scout team did this past week and which which helped them into basically blowing out St. John's. Oh yeah, it's huge. I mean, yeah, you try to give them at, when you're on the scout team, you want to do the best you can. Obviously, you want to you want to play and practice. You know, when you're red shirting, like my red shirt year, I wanted to get better. So working on stuff like you know the scout team, we we'd work on whatever player I was being. I'd try to work on you know what they were good at. Try to work on my game, but also I want to play well. So I'm going to do stuff that isn't necessarily in the, the scouting report, but uh, mm -hmm. you just try to do the best you can to, to give them a look of what they're going to end up seeing in the game. Uh, <laughs> but, I'm laughing because you just said something that is so Isaiah, and I'm, I'm going to catch <laughs> a lot of these, I'm sure, as we go on today. But like you're, you Loki just said, I'm also trying to do stuff that isn't on the scouting report. <laughs> <laughs> like, why is that your job? <laughs> <laughs> doing my job I'm that's not even hard. your job bro. <laughs> do your job do your job you feel I'm doing my job but that's, <laughs> that's why and what I just said there that you caught is why when I in my fifth year I'd be so upset at the scout team because I'd be <laughs> doing stuff that isn't on the scouting report that he's not going right. to do that but that's right. you know, how it is and that's you know that's why you know not being not playing anymore I miss that that kind of stuff because you you know you'd fight with you know in practice and yell at teammates for doing stuff like that but at the end of the day it's literally it's you guys are brothers and you know we'd all go into the locker room at the end of the day and and I'd appreciate you know them doing what they had to do and try to get me ready and so yeah you just it's a love hate relationship, but it's always good, you know, when it comes time to playing the other team and you, you know, beat their ass, it's, it's worth it. The two guys in my career that I 
they've both been on the podcast before and I'm sure they'd attest to this. And I think I've been pretty consistent in saying this. The two guys that I hated suiting up again the most in scout team was Taylor Stonebrook and Ross Farini. Ross Farini because he just had the famous Ross two-step where just like you said, Isaiah, like you're trying to prepare for the guy that you're about to play. But Ross is like, nah, screw all that. I, I'm trying to get my Ross Ross too right now, you know? So Ross will just hit you with the Ross two-step. He'll be like, hey, that other guy isn't going to do that. And he would just flash jumper after jumper. And then Taylor Stormberg, like, people don't understand how intelligent and how high his basketball IQ really was. So any, like, little advantage that he tried to get on you, whether or not the other team did it, he was doing it. And, you know, the coaches who are coaching the scout team, they're clapping their hands like, yeah, yeah, keep going at him. It's just like the guy that we're about to play will <laughs> not do that. But also, like, you have to encourage those guys because, you know, they are sacrificing a whole lot to be there and to help the team. They don't get a whole lot of shine. And it's important, like, in, in a situation like this where I'm so appreciative of both Ryans uh, saying how important the scout team was to them, especially for that game. Like, now we're having a chance, you and I, to express that you haven't been on the scout team and also having to play against those guys. Those guys, they work their butts off, and they don't get a whole lot of shine, no. and they have to do it year long. Uh, and I'm sure in their minds, they're just like, man, like I should be out there on the court, I should be out there on the court, but they're doing what needs to be done in order to contribute to winning basketball. So shouts out to the scout team, to all the guys who help report, to help prepare uh, the guys to play. Your job is not going to notice, and you know you are loved for that, trust me. like it, no, It's not a one-way street. Like We love won't. you for that. It won't be publicly noticed, but that you definitely mm -hmm. are you, you are loved because we, we've been there. So, uh, Also, we know St. John's defense to be, you know, such an aggressive team that, that likes to deflect, uh, steal the ball. They get a lot of their points off of deflections and fast break opportunities after getting stopped. But the Jays were really able to stifle all of that. They didn't turn the ball over much. Uh, seven all together to a St. John's team that I really like to turn teams over. Uh, we obviously gave props to the scout team and, and the look that they gave to the guys. But when it happens in real time on the court, sometimes it could be something totally different. Uh, and, and it's an adjustment that needs to be done. But the Jays never really had to do that because they really took care of the ball and were able to find the open looks. Talk to me about like teams that like to get after you, that like to pressure you uh, in the full court, in the quarter court. Uh, how difficult it is to play in the team, uh, play against a team kind of like St. John's and, and the makeup of their defense and how important it is to have that ball security in order to get the looks that you're looking for. Well, yeah, I mean, people, they'll see, you know, the, the outside, the fans will notice that they like to jump passing lanes and go for steals. And, and then, you know, obviously they'll say, oh, you got to take care of the ball. Well, it's not necessarily always just, you know, simple passes, you know, back and forth. It's those passes where, you know, somebody drives kicks and then you go to make the extra pass that all of a sudden you're not expecting it, but they're, you know, athletic enough where they're going to try to jump that passing lane and takes that extra pass away that, you know, throws the whole rhythm off of, um, you know, the ball movement. But so you try to, you try to, you can't really prepare for it, but when you take care of the ball and don't make turnovers on plays like that, if you if you take care of the ball and don't give up live ball turnovers, the game for them all of a sudden became becomes okay. We're not getting fast break points. We have to actually score on offense, and then they start forcing. And so it, it really is just if you if you make the simple pass and don't give them fast break points, the game really slows down. So the Jays also made eleven threes. I think they had a lot better looks than the 11 that they made, obviously. Uh, you take away Xander Yates, three threes near the end of the game. That that means that they made eight threes, you know, in, in the moments that really matters before, you know, the game was basically called off because the Jays were up 22, 24 points at oh, that the, point in called time. Called the dogs off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah called the dogs off for sure. Uh, but, like, to your point where you said that, you know, it's not necessarily like the initial driving kick that gets you. It's the pass and the extra pass. I wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit too because like like you said, like sometimes like the fans are watching the game and they're just like, well, it, it seems like such a simple pass to make the corner. No, it's not. Those guys are long, they're athletic. And it's not so much like maybe that they'll deflect the ball is that they have just enough influence on the pass that it doesn't meet you in your shooting pocket and you have to kind of, you know, right. reach out and catch the ball. And then before you know it, that allows another closeout opportunity 
to come and you don't get the open looks. But the Jays were able to make those extra pass, make it crisp, and, and get those extra looks. They just didn't really knock it down there. He had the clip that I'm sure Mac and the staff would want him to, but at the same time, they did get those looks, which kind of goes back to the point that Ross was making a couple weeks ago about the quality of looks and us just having to knock it down. How, uh, let's say, confident are you about the Jays' ability to be able to knock those pass, extra pass threes down as the season winds down? Because that's been one of their struggles this year where we thought maybe they got better shooting from where they were at last year. But it just seems like they still haven't kind of gotten their footing of where they where you and I both think they need to be as far as people shooting is concerned. I, you know, I, uh, I have zero worry being a shooter and you, <laughs> you, you don't, you don't lose the confidence. Like if, if it's a wide open look, you're mad at yourself. Like, damn, that was, that's the best look I'll get all game. But you're right. not the next week. You're not going, well, I missed this wide open one last week. I'm not going to shoot this one. So, I mean, right. gonna <laughs> fall. at some point they're going to fall. Um, so, you know, if they're like Ross was saying, they're great looks and they're just not falling right now. So there's no reason to, to be, you know, scared, you know, nervous or, you know, panic and be like, oh, we're not making shot. They're going to fall. Eventually they will. Um, but you know, they just need to fall at the right times. Um, and like this last game, you know, you make eight when it really matters and 11 overall that, I mean, that's a, that's a good amount. 33 points off threes is, is, you know, something that a lot of teams can't do. So. Right. And it's, and maybe it's just me. I feel like maybe I've been spoiled with the group of guys that we played with because well, I just, I mean, been, why do I feel like some of the best shooters? <laughs> yeah. Let's not forget who we played with, <laughs> but that's the part too. Like, Pause. so they shoot, they shoot, um, 36 percent from three, right? They make 11, though, and 11 is, like, it, it's good. Mm -hmm. But why do I feel like 11 is not a lot for a Jays team? Like, am I so skewed with, you know, the era that I played in, with the Doug McDermott's of the world, the Ethan Rogge's of the world, the Isaiah Zierden's of the world, who were able to each make three to six threes a game, basically, on any given night? I always added in my little twos and fews here and there. Uh, you add a couple from Austin, a couple from Graham. Before you know it, we look down and we have like six and threes, right? So does it like is it just me? It, I, am I the yeah. one that's in the wrong by thinking that eleven is not enough? No, am I, not, am I the it, problem in this well, situation? It's, no, it's not. What you're the way you're looking at it is how Ross was kind of talking about. Like it's eleven isn't a lot. Like it's not a ton, but mm -hmm. with our with the looks that they're getting. 16 isn't out of the question like yeah that can happen and we were right. so used to that you know the way that how our percentage and how high uh you know doug and ethan's percentage and shooting threes was you know it looked we we'd all of a sudden we'd look up and we were like oh we got 17 threes today it's like mm -hmm. well yeah it's because you know the looks that we're getting and but I, to your point yeah 11 do, isn't a ton but the the misses that are good looks they're gonna fall and then all of a sudden you know coming up they'll look and they'll be okay we had 18 threes today mm -hmm. yeah i'm i'm waiting for that day where i could be like oh, hey, I, hey, like I didn't team. say it was gonna be tomorrow i didn't <laughs> say it was gonna be you know i'm just saying in the future coming up it'll be there it'll fall. well we we kind of need it to be tomorrow low-key because we have a very tough favorite team coming into the chi uh, a team that we lost to on the road very closely earlier this year. Uh, a very, you know, tough game uh, both ways. Tough game defensively for both teams. Um, and, you know, Coach Mack talked about, you know, that upcoming game in the postgame presser about how defensively they didn't really, you know, play up the snuff to, as well as they think that they should. Uh, that Xavier team in their own defense, I'm sure in their locker room, their their staff is also saying, you know what, we probably didn't defend as well as we could have um, because that first game against the uh, Xavier Musketeers um, was a very high scoring game. Uh, 90 to 87. It's a three point loss for the Jays. Uh, you know, I think both teams combined for 52 points that have, if I'm not mistaken. And that was the highest up to that point in Biggie's play. It might still be. I need to check with those records, but here we go again. Two teams that are vying for the top spot in the Big East playing in Omaha this time around. 
Um, with that being said, it's going to be most likely a high scoring game unless one of the teams really like sit down and, and really get their defense anchored down and, and get the stops that they want. <laughs> Seeing that that first game was just so challenging for the Jays defensively, what do you think, you know, Coach Mack and the staff is saying to the guys in the locker room in order to get their defensive mindset where it needs to be in order to, you know, be successful against a very tough and very offensive minded Xavier team? We, I mean, we, uh, we used to talk about it. It'd be two stops. It was most of the time at halftime. It'd be two stops mm -hmm. and a score and then two stops and a score. So you, four stops, two scores, and then all of a sudden you build the confidence. Um, so, I mean, if you think you come out of the game and you can get four stops right off the off the bat, I mean, that all of a sudden your confidence and your defense just – you feel great. Like, you feel like mm -hmm. they're not going to hit a shot. You know, you start flying around, helping each other. Um, and that's what that's what you really need. So, I mean, even if you just cut that, let's just say two stops. You get two stops right off the bat to to start the game. That That's a huge, huge jump considering, you know, how high the scoring of a game it was last time. Mm -hmm. So, just two stops and, and a score and you, the confidence will be good. Uh, Sule, boom. Who's their starting point guard for Xavier? Gave Crane fits uh, in Cincinnati last time. Obviously, he's going to be a key point for Mac and the defense to stop. Uh, but the thing with Xavier is they're they're really gritty. Uh, they can really stretch out the floor. They're the best three point shooting team in the Big East right now, as of today, as of this recording. Uh, so obviously, defending the three point line is going to be a thing that we're going to be looking at whether or not the Jays can or cannot do. Uh, give me tips for, you know, defending the three-point line against a team that really likes to spread out, use those spread ball screens to get kickouts, and like we mentioned before, extra passes in order to get their feet set and, and knock the three down. All right. The, you know, the big thing is you got to do the the two guys in the, the ball screen have to do, you know, their best um, <laughs> to guard the, the pick and roll. Um, you can't let them get too far downhill. And then if they do, you – as much as you don't, I'm not saying you give up a layup. You can't leave shooters in the corner because if they get too far downhill and you help off the corner, the corner three is the easiest. So you don't want to give corner threes to the best shooting three-point team in the conference, um, especially, you know, after not being able to get stops the last time. So, um, but it starts, it starts with the, the two in the, the ball screen. So do their best and then don't help. Don't leave the corner. Xavier is once again in Omaha for a pink out game. <laughs> Excuse me. They ruined the James, the Jays pink out game last season. Here they come again. It's a pink out. You and I have played in a number of those. You participated in five of them. They, they ruined one of our pink out four. games. No, I know we no yeah, one ruined our pink out for sure. What, it, we <laughs> have yours, that was like, thing. Yeah, they were like twenty five or something. They just blew us out. What year was that? I don't. Uh, might have been my junior year. Mm -hmm. I think. So it was, would that have been Marcus Foster's senior year? I, am I right in saying that? No, well, because I graduated. Marcus was a year after me, right? Yeah, because he he had one more year after me. Mm -hmm. So it would have been when he redshirted. It was his redshirt year. Gotcha. Uh, my junior year. Yeah, they came in. And we were all hype. And then they just, we could not get a stop. <laughs> we couldn't get a stop. We were doing everything. And they were just hitting shots, getting whatever they wanted. But, yeah, they did that to us, too. So tomorrow, tomorrow talk, talk to me. Talk to me about the importance of the pink out game. Obviously, like for everybody knows someone who's been affected with not only breast cancer, but any type of cancer. It's a really, you know, sad uh, situation that we're in that we still haven't figured out a, a cure for such a terrible disease. But for that game, when you see all those fans who are, you know, shouting out the people that they're standing up for, the people that they're fighting for, the people that they're donating their money for. Talk to me about the emotions that go into a pink out game. Uh, you know, just as a player, as someone who's just a person in this world who cares about other people. Talk to me about like when you're about to play a pink out game, what that means to you and and why that game is so special and why Coach Mack has made it such a special thing in Omaha. You know, it's um, 
like you said, it's just it's bigger than you. It's bigger than the game of basketball. It's just life. Um, and for me, it was different. My mom went through it. So every pink out game, I always put her on my shoes so that I knew, you know, who I was playing for um, in my heart. And then obviously the people, you know, they pay to to have names on the jerseys. Um, and I got mm -hmm. to know a few um, personally, you know, Julie Moore, who passed away, um, unfortunately, and, and Ray Jans, who also passed away, both from cancer. But, you know, it's tough. You know, you get to know people like that and who are great people, and they just – it it is more than a game. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a great way for, you know, to get a win and have people get away from thinking about it, – it's a way for people to get away from their troubles. Um, so being able to to go out there and and play well and and get a dub is um, it's big it's big it's always nice to to get a pink out dub. One of the things that I've always appreciated Mac and the staff for organizing is like you just mentioned. Not only do they you know auction off and donate the proceeds all to cancer research, but you get to actually meet the families who are you know, a part of this uh, special event, <clears throat> sorry, just kind of choking up a little bit thinking about, you know, my time and, and the people that I've met over the years just through that game. And you kind of want to stay in touch with them and see how everybody's doing. You kind of mentioned about the people that you met and it, it's been an unfortunate loss that they were able to leave us so, or they had to leave us so soon due to this terrible disease. But <clears throat> Like I said, it's just it's such a special moment to be able to meet those families and uh, yeah. not only those families, but they, they're able to bring out their friends and their extended family. You take pictures, you meet them, you swap numbers, you know, every once in a while you, you kind of get close to these families. And, and that's kind of what it's all about. You know, we, we like you said, we realize that the game is so much or, or that particular game is so much bigger than just basketball itself. It, it's a chance to really understand how all of this affects all of us. Like I mentioned before, like we all know someone who has been affected or who has died because of this. Um, and and I'm, I've always been so appreciative of, of Mac and the staff and obviously everybody that is behind running that pink out game for us to be able to meet those people and, and to shake hands with them and to pray with them and, and to just show them the little bit of support that we possibly can. Because, you know, they are Jays fans. They support us through and through. You never really know what people are going through, but uh, you know, they, they show us love and it's only right that we show them love in return as well. So no. I'm very much looking forward to, you know, what it's going to be like. Oh, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it reminds you, um, cause you can always get lost in the season, um, with how you're doing, how the team's doing. It's, it's, it's more than the game. Um, mm -hmm. but, it is it's definitely it's really nice win or lose it you know obviously you'd never like to lose but win or lose you know meeting the families and talking to them and it 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 really is it's it's great um yeah I don't I don't think people people think it's like a hassle that you know we have to do that like we we enjoyed that I, I at least I did I always looked at mm -hmm. it as like this is you know the little if I can touch somebody's life um that that was always a, a great feeling for me let's get back into basketball before I, I start tearing up right, before I, yeah, yeah, before I start. <laughs> so you talked about it a little bit earlier in the podcast, how it's been such an up and down season for the Jays. Uh, that our last loss was to the Xavier team that they're about to face uh, tomorrow. Um, but since then, they beat Providence at home, a top 25 team. They went on the road at Butler, which is never an easy place to play. Uh, uh, such a historic uh, arena there. And then they come back home and, and they do what they did last night or a couple of nights ago, uh, as of this recording, to St. John's. Does it feel like the Jays are up uh, on the upswing of this roller coaster ride? Because it's been really being up and down and up and down. Does it feel like right now we're kind of riding this, let's call it a stock that's simply just rising and it's not really going to crash so much anymore? Is that what we're feeling since they've had this three point winning streak or this three game winning streak, should I say, uh, these last couple of games? Yeah, it goes, it, it's confidence. Um, you know, the more that, 
shots fall and you know you share the ball your confidence goes up but yeah you always obviously you always hope that it's you know you're never going down and everything's you know on the up and never gonna never gonna come back down but yeah it's confidence and hopefully you know you keep riding that confidence and it'll be another another couple wins but obviously you know it'll it'll come down at some point but it shouldn't be a you know discouraging thing when it does um since you know it definitely won't be to the players but hopefully not to the fans because they they see what what is the the potential that it, it could be so I think the fans, now that I'm on this side of things, having been doing this podcast for a couple of years now and having to actually be like critical of the Jays when need be uh, in order to give a fair assessment, even though I call this the most biased podcast in the universe, uh, you have to be critical sometimes when things, yeah, when things are going right, you have to be critical. And I think the fans, like I've now realized that they are the hardest people to convince about like the uh, status of the team as it happens so like when we win we're world beaters we're national champions nothing can go wrong when we lose it's just like what is going on with the team how can we fix it expeditiously <laughs> it's just such, it's just such a roller coaster being on this side and having to critique the team have you seen it in yourself as well like now that you're a fan now that you're years removed from lacing up for the jays when you see them win are you like crazy ecstatic where you think like oh we're about to be natty champs and then when they lose, are you just like, man, like we're NIT now? No. <laughs> well, I don't ever go. I've never been a guy who's like that extreme. I don't, I've never ridden the extremes in that sense. But like yeah. I, I've been, <laughs> I watched them lose to Marquette in a public, like I was in public at that point and I was wearing Creighton mm-hmm. stuff. And I had people like, oh, yeah, you, you, you're a Creighton fan. And I was like, mm hmm. Like, yep. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. like, let, let me just get out of here real quick. But mm-hmm. yeah, no, it's definitely when you win, it's like, OK, yeah, I'm going to wear this out proudly. And then when <laughs> it's a loss, you're like, I'm, you know, I'm proud, but I'm still going to just move on out of here real quick. I've been sheltered with the fact that I've been in Europe while doing this. So I don't <laughs> see like the brunt of living in the Midwest like you do um like chicago minnesota like those are big crane alumni markets for sure so i know when you're back at the cribbles you see a whole <laughs> bunch of people repping their squads you rep yours if you win it's the best night of your life if you right. lose like you just try to duck out the <laughs> back you gotta, you're like hey another round real quick and you just dip out everyone's paying attention to something else <laughs> right oh man i i can't wait till the day that i'm just you know back who knows where I'll be when it is all said and done for my basketball career, but oh, hey, uh, are, let's call it back in a oh, hey, those, situation those, where college those, basketball those, super batters. Though hey, you ride that way, man. It's different. Bro, I but honestly, like here's the one of the things that I've been uh kind of upset that I haven't had a chance to do so far yet. Every once in a while, like I'll see guys who are back in Omaha. So like Marcus Zagorowski, who was back at a game last year, you know, he got his flowers. He was introduced. He got a standing ovation from the crowd and everything. You know, Doug's gone back a couple of times. Um, you know, I, I've just seen guys over the years just being able to go back to able to be able to actually watch a game where we used to play a game. That's the thing that I haven't been that I haven't had the chance to do so far yet. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, my only thing is that they better win the night that I'm in the building. <laughs> they well, better not lose the night that I'm in the building. Well, I haven't, I haven't been back either. Um, but mm-hmm. I'm actually, and I don't want this to make it like anything i'm going back uh next week or two weekends so that'll be my first game back to to actually watch um since playing but yeah no i it's definitely it'll be a a sentimental moment for sure but Mm -hmm. i don't i don't think you should say i want that you know can't wait for that but you play man play because others others like myself who can't anymore who wish they could just you play you play till you I'm, really can't. I'm looking forward to do you know what game it's gonna be so we can be the first one to put it out? Which game that you're gonna be able to watch? It's the it's the Yukon one. I wanna say is what uh what day is that? The eleventh or yeah. uh the Yukon the game 11th. is gonna be yeah, Saturday the eleventh. It's an yeah, afternoon yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It'll, 
it'll really be cool. that. And I'm going with uh, Zach and his wife and TC and his wife. And then, so. The boys, you love to hear it. I, yeah, so I'm going to be good. honestly tuned in for that game. I that'll cannot wait. I cannot wait to try and look at you in the stands. And see. Oh, man. <laughs> I hope I no, not. Because I know somebody's listening that's going to have some <laughs> – influence to like point the jumbotron camera and hey look i'm already texting the, the people <laughs> no, that I don't i'm gonna be i'm just gonna be like this the whole game i'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good group to go watch a game with shout out tc shout out zach hansen hell yeah bro yeah. that's gonna be such a fun game and uconn obviously being a top 25 team and the the really good team in the big east that they are this year like that's gonna be another hype game for sure i'm looking forward to mm-hmm. that one as well as all the games on the stretch, because like you know, there's no easy games in in uh, conference play. Like us being in the valley before, shout out to the to the valley championship flag that I got behind me, and then moving to the Big East. Like in either conference, there's no easy games. I was kind of surprised my senior year that we were able to go undefeated at home, um, and which means that we beat every Big East team at home. Right. Because that never happened in the Valley. And oh, people would, were like, oh, well, the Valley is an easier conference. It's just like, no, it's not about easy conference or not. It's about the teams knowing each other and, like, playing each other and knowing the tendencies and what to stop and what you can kind of live with, quote, unquote. Uh, so, yeah, no game is easy in the Big East, but that's going to be a game that I'm going to be looking forward to for Wait, sure. Yeah, they didn't know us because we were those cat, you know, the new cats. We oh, we were the new cats. cats. <laughs> why are these cats you know who who are thinking they, they who are these cats and on the road and win who are these cats you know like that that <laughs> that post game press conference or speech will forever <laughs> live in the back oh. of my mind <laughs> but do, hey, do you kind of remember it verbatim because i kind of want to give the fans oh, you know I, what coach mag said to us we were six in one in the biggies at that point and it was, and it was the week that we, we yeah, yeah, it was the week. It was St. John's. We had just beat was St. John's. It St. It John's? That we went, we lost to Providence on a Saturday night. We beat. <laughs> Waxed uh, Nova. <laughs> yeah, Nova on the road, right? That's that infamous game where we made, at that point, a Biggie's high 21 threes. And see what I mean? Like, we made 21 threes and whatever. Wait, anyway, we really already talked realize about Realize what we all did. Like, we, yeah. we started with. with then it's five threes, and then it was. Just like, okay. <laughs> and then I, I think you us can, were like, "Hang on, right. I want to get in on this." Me, I was, me I, next. I was, next. I was tapping Mac. I was like, "Hey, let me get in for a couple of threes. <laughs> uh, if I remember correctly, I think you made three that game. Mm-hmm. I made four that game. Austin made a couple. Devin Brooks made one. Right, yeah, like I, we were all we were all right. splashing. Uh, Grant Gibbs was hurt, so he didn't play. Okay, Avery, I love you, but I have to say, that. man, don't do it. No, I wasn't gonna say it. I wasn't gonna say it. Avery, I love you. Avery Digman, I think, was the only backcourt player that game to not make a three. I, I think. I don't think it was just backcourt. I think it was. No, because Jeffrey Grossell got in. Uh, got it done. Hey. <laughs> Isaiah, let's go back to Coach Max's speech. It was so we lost the Providence. <laughs> we lost the Providence. Oh. Wow, let's talk about a roller coaster of emotions on this show. The ups and the downs. Yeah, yeah, we right. we lost the Providence. We go to Nova. We do what we do there. We had St. John's at home, as in we were about to go to Madison Square and play St. John's that very next week. So we beat St. John's at home. Um, the back, the illegal screen that you set for Doug to get open. Uh, it wasn't illegal. When, I was pushed. I fell. You guys can go back. I wasn't YouTube on, and, and I wasn't on perfect balance, but I wasn't moving. All I remember is as I passed the ball to Doug was both of your oh. arms you remember falling backwards. You remember you were the one that was supposed to be setting the screen, and right. I was supposed to be the one throwing the pass. Uh, coming off the handoff and throwing the pass. On the, the defense, yeah, on defense, we had gotten – we switched because uh, they did some cross or we did something, and we switched, and then we were mm-hmm. on opposite sides. And we both – if you look, we both just pointed like, okay. At each other, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we ended up and- switching. 
Yeah. I love the details that you remember yeah, off people that just play won't because pick that up, but me and you, yeah, we looked and we both pointed at each other. And then it's so through the pass, and then I set that, you know, infamous illegal screen. I got pushed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you you felt into Doug. Could have been called an N1 too. Doug stood up and had like that yell into the crowd. Uh, I think St. John's called a timeout after that. Yeah. But like I love the little details that you just mentioned about like just the eye contact, the the finger pointing, like, okay, like you're there and I'm there. I know we weren't supposed to both be there, but we know what each other's job is supposed to do. So so no matter what the situation was, it was just like you're supposed to come out the handoff and fling that pass. I'm supposed to be the one sitting that illegal back screen. <laughs> but we well, just split because it wasn't like I was <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm gonna set the most illegal screen here egregiously illegal screen that got dug. <laughs> uh, and then, so we win that game. We end up winning that game, right? Coach Matt comes into the locker room. I think we're 6-1 and one or 7-1 and one in our very first Big East uh, regular season. And Coach Mack has a speech that goes as follow, Isaiah, you're on the floor. Let's hear it. Let's hear your rendition of what Coach Mack said. <laughs> I don't want hey, – I know Mack will be mad. I don't remember <laughs> word for Look, word. I just know – Mack is a you, good sport, and he knows that we no, love him. If, if, him. Right. Come on now. <laughs> no, I know. But if you – if anybody remembers the Allen Iverson practice speech, that was Mack's <laughs> who are these cats speech <laughs> after the game. <laughs> It was, it was every other, every other thing was, who are these cats? These cats keep winning. Who, why are they going on the road and winning in the big, who are these cats? Everything had to, every, everything came back to who are the cats and we are the cats. Right. We, we are those cats. We were, we were all looking around like, wait, we're cats. Wait, we're, we're cats. cats. Yeah. <laughs> that was when. Avery is a guy that I'm sure knows that oh, speech he'll know verbatim. Word. Yeah. But I remember just sitting there and like being super hyped, obviously, because at that point we're tied for number one with Nova, who we had just beat that uh that week. Uh we all thought that like we you know we kind of messed up against Providence. That's not a game that they should have got over us. Uh we later came to find out down the line that they were for real, you know, that that you know they beat us in the uh conference. Uh, tournament championship game, right? That was a really good Providence team. But, you know, at that time, we were just like, we messed up on the road. We should have beat Providence. But we saw we did to Villanova, and we just beat a very tough, gritty St. John's team who, like we mentioned, this team, they love to turn you over, get up into you, deflect the basketball, you know, things of that nature. So we're all feeling really good about ourselves. And I remember just sitting there looking at Mac, and Mac being like, you know what all these guys are thinking about, right? Who are these cats? Who are these guys? Who are these guys from Omaha coming into our building and feeding? Who are these cats? <laughs> and it was just just such a good moment and like such a feel good moment for all of us in the locker room. Which, you know, going into that year, we we were all recruited to play in the valley at that point. Like minus Devin and uh, you know, uh, who was a guy that like Coach Mac brought in for Big East play, basically thinking that you know we needed to change our style plays somewhat to, to to be a little bit more athletic, a little bit more dynamic at that point guard spot, especially. But myself, Austin, Grant, you, Doug, uh, Ethan, you know, like Jeff, like Will Artino, all the way down the line, we were all recruited to be a really good Valley team. That switch up to the Big East uh, meant a lot to us because <clears throat> that was like a situation that we never saw ourselves playing in. Right. And all of a sudden you, you look up and you're in the Big East and you're, a top team in the Big East in your very first year there. So it was just such a very good, like, it was such a feel-good moment for all of us. Oh, yeah. And for yeah. Mac to, like, express himself the way that he did, like, I, uh, I, that's the thing that I'll never forget. Well, I'm sure you had, you know, a, a similar conversation, but I had just redshirted uh, for the last year, you know, the 2013 Valley Championship. And then mm -hmm. it's my freshman year, redshirt freshman year, and, you know, we're going into the Big East. So I had a very, me and Mac had a very pointed, you know, hour long meeting that I wasn't recruited to play in the Big East. So I was going to have to do um, certain things and get better in, in areas that I wasn't expected to and get stronger and all this stuff. So, you know, and then, you know, fast forward to that moment. Yeah, it's funny. It, it's, you look back and laugh about it now, but at that time, yeah, mm -hmm. we were we were feeling pretty good. 
um, just because no one expected um, really that level of play from us. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was definitely a, a moment that I'll, I'll remember forever. I remember that conversation with me and Mac uh, about what my role was going to be now that we are in the Big East. Basically, it was about like having to step up as a leader. And I remember thinking up to that point, like I'm a junior going to my senior year and I'm just like, bro, I've given you as much leadership as I can possibly give you. Like, I didn't think, you know, that there was another level that I could go to, but he really challenged me every day to, you know, you know, fix myself, look in the mirror, come in with the right mindset, make sure that the guys uh, are following my lead, especially defensively, which is what I think all of our biggest concern was, was how are we going to fare defensively with these longer, more athletic, uh, higher basketball IQ, so to speak, players, right? And it was a bit of a challenge early on, obviously, as we're getting acclimated to, the, to a new league. But, like, I'm so glad that he had that conversation with me because – up until that point, I was just kind of thinking like, dude, like I've done everything that you asked me to do as far as leadership is concerned. But he really challenged me to try to put up to that next level. And, you know, I, I kind of learned a lot that senior about like, I, I'm a, I've always been a vocal guy, guys. I have my own podcast. Like, I don't think that's, yeah. that's needless to be said, right? I've always been a pretty vocal guy. Unless but it I was, think, unless it was six or 7 a.m. weights. You were the most. Oh yeah, no, I was. That was Coach Bailey. Come on, bro. Like, why you gotta like get us up like that? <laughs> that was always you, our bro. joke. We'd be like, oh, we'd look at the schedule. We'd be like, oh, we got seven a.m. weights, and wow, Jahan won't be vocal today. Nah, that's a quiet day for twelve for sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, like I, I was able to kind of dig a little bit deeper and understand what it means to lead guys like I, I always say this like I learned about guys' tendencies on a more personal level that year which maybe I would not have if Max didn't have that conversation with me and obviously different conversation conversation that the years went on but I knew like a guy like Isaiah like I didn't have to yell at you you know I could just kind of pull you to the side and be like hey like you just got to do this do that better you know a guy like Austin him and I like got into like not yelling matches but we knew that we could be like really loud with each other and it was all love. It was no disrespect. We just try to get the best out of each other in that moment, right? And right. then a guy like Ethan Roggy is another guy like, okay, don't, don't yell at Ethan. Walk over to him and talk to him. That Those aren't things that I necessarily picked up in those first three years, but I challenged myself to try to be the best leader on a more individual uh, basis. You know what I mean? As opposed to just being right. just overall like braggadocious, yell a lot, uh, super loud guy that I was those first three years. So yeah, you know, it, it, it all, that, those that's, why it tied, that that's why it ties in because Mac, you know, had told me, you know, I need to get better defensively, which I had known coming into, you know, even redshirting that I needed to get better defensively. But, you know, just me, I, I'd always, and I'm sure you remember every time I'd always try to ask you, like, hey, what do you do on this, like, on this screen? Like, you try to get through, you try to, you know, shortcut it, you try to, do this and that you try to chase like you try to just little things and I always tried to pick your brain about what you do um because Mac had told me about that and obviously you um were the the guy that we were putting on the best offensive player um and so that year I feel like your senior year a lot is you know that helped me but then that <laughs> that translated into Mac that next conversation going all right so now you put your hands and i'm like no man no i want to shoot i want to shoot i don't want to chase people i want to shoot <laughs> and so but that's uh it was yeah it was a funny it was a funny evolution of how that that all worked out it was just kind of uh, let's just say he he placed the dominoes perfectly uh yeah for how he wanted and, and he and he know he knows how to do that too because <laughs> When I go back and I chill with some of those guys in the summer and I kind of have a chance to be a fly on the wall and watch him practice a little bit, you could kind of see, like, who, like you said, he knows how to place that domino so that when the next one falls, it just kind of keeps carrying over. Yeah. And now, like, you know, last year it was Alex O'Connell who really took that defensive mentality of, like, okay, like, I'm the guy that is going to be stuck onto the best perimeter offensive player if it's a point guard, if it's a two guard, if it's a three guard, it's going to be me. 
And now this year we see Trey Alexander kind of doing that same thing where he's kind of chasing around their best offensive player on the perimeter. Mac is able to hide guys a little bit like Ryan Nemhard, who, you know, maybe that's not that might not be his strong suit of being able to defend uh, the taller and, and more explosive guys, but he's able to stick a guy like Trey Alexander on there. And I'm just excited to see like who that next domino oh, is going to be. Always, I'm sure you know <laughs> he'll have he'll have somebody that he'll be like, mm-hmm. all right, hey, you need to you need to start asking him what what he does, and you know, and then all of a sudden he'll be like, okay, so now you're them, you're chasing right. you're chasing the best player in the country around ball screens now. <laughs> You're like, what? How did this yeah. last yeah, year? I was just, I was just <laughs> trying to learn. Now I'm all of a sudden. I I remember my freshman year. I was really like, <laughs> dude, stick your ass in the corner and knock down threes if you can. And then by my sophomore year, I became like the guy that needed to do all those things. And you know that that's okay. It takes a lot out of you. That's why I'll forever respect the guys who like yourself, like stepped up to that kind of challenge and are able to, to sacrifice for the betterment of the team because. We all want to be offensive stars. They're just not necessarily realistic and and how a team works. But you know, you, you have to kind of accept things there's as they are. There's only so many players culture. that can say there's no I in team, but there is a me. You know, like Kobe. Right. And there's only there's oh, only a handful that can say that. So you mm-hmm. always want to win. You'll do whatever for the team, bro. My guy Z, thank you so much for being on the show today. I appreciate you so much. Uh, anything that you want to say to the Jays fans while you, we have you here today? No, I, uh, well, first, thank you. Uh, thank you to the producers for having me. Um, obviously, the Jay, Jays fans already know it's nothing but love. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll see you guys on the 11th. Hell yeah. He's going to be in-house for that UConn game. We're definitely going to have you back onto the show later on in the season for sure. Actually, you know what? Let's try if we can to have you back after that UConn game. I'd love to get your in-house sitting down perspective uh, about what you saw and everything. That would be pretty cool if we're able to, you know, make that all work out. But uh, again, dude, I appreciate you so much. You're my baby bro for life. 12-21. You already know what time it is. 21. Can you do something for me? (laughs) (laughs) My guy, Biggie. (laughs) <laughs> All right, this has been another episode of the Welcome to the J podcast. I am your host, Jahans Managa. This has been my guest, Isaiah Here. Ziggy, Zigma Zierden. Shouts out to all the people in the background. Josh, I see you working, uh, doing what doing what you got to do as a producer for sure. We certainly appreciate everything that you do. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Field of 68 Media Network. Until next time, as always, go Jays.